In this video, we will start developing the software for the vehicle. There are various different software modules needed for the complete solution. Here, we will focus on the modules needed for making the vehicle move. The control software. The plan is to use the keyboard as the input to manually control the speed and steering of the vehicle. This is the fourth video in the overall project. The project is to build a deep learning Raspberry Pi controlled autonomous vehicle. The project will cover the system from end to end, from building the hardware, the base RC chassis, and attaching the Raspberry Pi and the associated electronics, and then getting it all working. It then works through the planning and development of the software that controls it all, as well as the training and the testing of various machine learning algorithms to see how well they go at line following. So far, we've connected together the physical hardware of the vehicle, but to get this thing driving as an autonomous vehicle, we need to create the software that ties it all together. There are four main hardware bits that we need to work with in the software. These are the camera, the Raspberry Pi, the intelligence, the steering, and the motor. To drive autonomously, the software basically runs in a continuous loop. Firstly, capturing an image from the camera. Images are the prime source of information for the decisions on how to drive. We need to be able to rapidly capture images. The image data is processed by the Raspberry Pi, which makes decisions on what we need to do with the steering and sends out the required commands. As well, we can also get the system to decide on the vehicle's speed and send out the motor commands. But initially, we will control the speed from the keyboard. Central to all of this is the mapping. The mapping translates the incoming image pixel data into the steering and motor commands. This is where machine learning comes into the autonomous vehicle. For the mapping, we will use a neural network. We will try and teach the vehicle how to drive by showing it sets of good image and steering motor command data recorded with a human driver. Then, leveraging machine learning, we will train the neural network to learn the mapping so that the vehicle will be able to copy the human behavior. So, how should we go about building the software? Firstly, we need to be able to grab the images coming in from the camera. Image capture can be slow. We need to ensure that we decouple it from the other software so it doesn't slow down everything else. And we need to be able to access the most recent up-to-date image. The captured image needs to be processed by the machine learning process. This is basically performing inference using the trained neural network. This inference step will be slowish on the Raspberry Pi, so it also needs to be decoupled. The neural network performs a mapping, with the output being a set of steering and motor commands. These need to be translated into the required format for driving the steering and motor, which is basically pulse width modulated output. Now this is the main flow for driving. However, we also need some supporting pieces to help collect the data to actually train our machine learning. We need to be able to save the various commands that are sent to the steering and the motor. We also need to save the incoming images. And we also need to be able to drive the vehicle ourselves to collect the good human driver data for initial training. We will keep it as simple as possible and just use keyboard inputs for our driving. We also need some kind of display or output just to let us know what is going on. These are all the main components that should result in a fully functioning autonomous vehicle. Over the next couple of videos, I will walk through each of these. I will be presenting a pseudocode to give an understanding of what each piece does. In the remainder of this video, I will dive into the key pieces needed to allow us firstly to drive the car around. These include the keyboard input, 
the ability to display some status data, and the steering motor control. So let's walk through the pseudocode now. Altogether, we have around 150 lines in the file. Let's look at some of the main logic. Here we have the keyboard input thread. We are running this as a separate thread, as it has to be responsive to user input. We can't afford to have this blocked by other ongoing processes. It has two parameters, one being the keyboard queue. The thread outputs the incoming keyboard data to this queue, where some other process consumes it and actions it. The message queue is another outgoing queue, which allows the thread to display messages to the user on the terminal. In the thread, we basically loop forever. We block, waiting to receive a keyboard input character. First up, we check to see if it is a meaningful control character. And if yes, then we place it on the outgoing keyboard queue, non-blocking. Then if needed, we can place some useful or some helpful status message on the outgoing message queue to be displayed to the user. And finally, we check the input character. If it was quit, then we drop out of the loop and the keyboard thread terminates. This will be the trigger that starts shutting down all of the other processes. Next, we've got the output display thread. This simply takes the message queue as input. And here it loops forever, retrieving any messages that have been placed on the message queue, a blocking call, and displays them on the screen. The next main component is the motor steering control thread. This is responsible for interpreting the keyboard inputs and sending out the commands to the motor and steering. It has three incoming parameters. The first is the keyboard queue. This thread is the consumer of the keyboard commands placed on the queue. The second parameter, the message queue, allows this thread to send out status information to be displayed to the user. And the third parameter is a run flag, which is used as a trigger to tell the thread when to shut down. Now to make our life a little easier, we have encapsulated the vehicle logic in its own class. This class manages the overall state of the vehicle and models how it reacts to keyboard inputs and what the resulting speed and steering outputs should be. We have another helper class, which is a wrapper for the motor and steering servo. It converts the internal speed and steering values to the PWM pulse width data that gets sent to the servo driver hat. Now firstly, we grab the initial speed and steering data from the vehicle logic, and we send these values out to the motor and steering servo. Then we loop until the run flag tells us to stop. We do a non-blocking retrieve from the keyboard queue, which should grab the latest inputs from the user, and use the value, if any, to update the current vehicle logic state. Then from the vehicle logic, we request the next values for the speed and steering that need to be applied, and we send those out to the motor and steering servo. Now in this main vehicle control loop, we want to try and keep some consistent timing. We would like to update the vehicle guidance, say, 20 times per second. So we sleep a variable amount of time so that the loop has a constant period. Then when the run flag indicates for us to stop, we drop out of the loop and send a stop command to the motor and steering. Now here are the two helper classes. The vehicle logic manages the state of the vehicle. It has two methods, one to process any new keyboard inputs, where it updates the internal vehicle speed state and the steering state. And we have another method that we can call at any time to request a new value for speed and steering. Based on the vehicle state, it calculates the updated values, which can then be sent to the motor and the steering driver. And the second helper class, the motor steering driver, is just a wrapper to encapsulate the details of the pulse width modulation data that we need to send to the motor. 
internally within the software, we try and deal with speed and steering commands between plus and minus one. This class uses the previously configured calibration data for the speed controller, the neutral point, the max forward and the max reverse pulse widths, and for the steering, the nominal center, the offset to the nominal center, and the plus and minus full lock range for the steering. The main method is to send out the speed and steering commands. It takes as input the next speed and steering values. We firstly ensure that these values are within the internal valid range between plus and minus one. And then we map these values into the relevant pulse width lengths. For the speed, this is between the maximum reverse and maximum forward pulse widths. And for the steering, it maps to between the plus and minus full lock values centered on the calibrated center value. And then we send them off to the servo driver hat. And finally, we have a master process that gets everything running. This uses a run flag for signaling to most of the processes. We create the message queue and the output display thread to process and display the messages. We create the keyboard queue, which transports around all of the user input commands. We create the motor steering control thread, which consumes the keyboard commands. We have another thread to actually capture the user input keyboard commands and place them on the keyboard queue. Now, after starting everything up, we basically wait for the user to terminate things by inputting the quit command. We then reset the run flag, which triggers the whole software to shut down gracefully. So that is an overview of the code. Now let's move over to the Raspberry Pi and try running the actual code. So here's the full Python code on the Raspberry Pi. Taking a quick look, we have around 500 lines of commented Python code. Some points to notice. We use the curses package for capturing the keyboard inputs, as well as for the output display to a terminal window. For inputs, we use the left and right keys for turning, and the up and down keys for speeding up and slowing down. In the keyboard input thread, we use the cursor's get char to capture the keyboard character inputs. For the outputs, we use the cursor's screen. One point to notice, that in the vehicle logic, we actually use steering pulses for steering. This means that when we push either the left or right arrows, it will increment the steering a certain amount to the left or right. And following that, the steering will decay exponentially back to the zero point or the center. We can control the decay. We will see how this goes when driving. Maybe we won't have any decay. Now scrolling down, these are just a few helper methods for the steering and speed inputs. In the motor steering driver, we have the low level PWM details, including the details of how we connect via I squared C and the channels for the servo and speed controller and the calibration details. And here's the main control thread, where we instantiate our vehicle logic and the motor steering driver. In the main control thread loop that we run through, we are targeting a loop period of around 0.05 seconds or 20 times per second. In the master vehicle process, we use a multi-processing event for the run flag. Later, we will have other processes to deal with. We instantiate all of the queues and threads, and finally we start the keyboard thread, and then wait for it to finish. And when it finishes, we clear the run flag and then gracefully shut everything down. 
So that's the code. Let's go up and start running this. Note that we are using the Curses module. We need to run this from a terminal window. So starting the program. You see some initial status details displayed, including the sleep timing statistics from the main control loop, as well as the motor speed and the steering position. When we start entering keyboard commands, we will display these towards the top of the terminal. So if we start incrementing the speed, you will notice that the motor speed starts increasing. Around about 1560, the wheels start to spin, and from 1565 they are spinning continuously. Pushing the up arrow, you can see the speed increasing and the wheels spinning faster. Now with the steering, when you push the right arrow, you can see the wheels turn initially and then slowly decay back towards zero. If you push the arrow multiple times, you can get the steering to full lock to the right and full lock to the left. And then it will exponentially decay back to the steering center again. Now, slowing down. We take it back to the zero point and decrease the speed, which will be interpreted as braking by the speed controller. And if we take it down a second time, it will start turning the wheels in the reverse direction. They start biting around 1440 and steering full lock right and full lock left. With the motor off, you can more clearly see the pulse steering. Pushing multiple times, you can get to full lock and it decays back to the center. Note that we can adjust the decay so we will see what best suits the model later. Now when we hit the Q button, it will start to shut things down and gracefully exit. So that was running on the workbench. Let's take it for a real spin. Overall, it functioned as expected. The pulse steering was usable, both with and without the decay. The driving did highlight that the turning circle wasn't the best. So after some online searches, I went and attacked the steering with a hobby knife and a small file. I had to remove some excess plastic around the drive shaft area, as well as trimming the lugs on the suspension arms. Overall, it gave around a 20 to 30% improvement in turning circle, and I had to rerun the steering calibration steps. In the next video, I will move on to the software needed for recording the image and control data. This is the next key step on the road to an autonomous vehicle, as it allows for the collection of training data to drive the machine learning algorithms. So till then, if you want to follow the overall project, please hit the subscribe button and feel free to like or comment.